So now I'd like to invite anyone who is young in body or in spirit to come on up to the front and share a little bit of a talk. I think it's more fun to hold the microphone. Here we go. So today, one of the things we're going to be talking about is um, the difference between being alone and being lonely. So I got two things here for you. Somebody want to tell me what I have? A mitten and a glove. Right, right. Mitten, glove. So what's, what's the difference between mittens and gloves? That gloves have, that gloves all have all your, the, all your fingers out and mittens only have the thumbs out and four fingers in the same place. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Very specific. So when you're wearing mittens, your fingers are all together. They're all together, and they can stay nice and warm when they're all together, because they each have a little bit of warmth, and that little bit of warmth can share amongst the fingers. So when it's super cold, which do you prefer to wear? Do you prefer gloves or mittens when it's super, super cold? <laughs> there we go. Yes, that is my point. <laughs> but when, when, it's, when it's a little bit less cold... Are there things that's tough to do with mittens? Yeah. Shoes. Yes, tying your shoes in mittens is a challenge. <laughs> Picking up a cup of coffee, very tough in mittens, yes. Anything else? Anybody else have one? <laughs> <laughs> Playing the piano in mittens, very tough, right. Playing the guitar while zipping up your jacket. Yes, that's very difficult, mittens or gloves, actually. <laughs> so there are some times when we really need to be together to share in the warmth of community. And there are some times when it's easier to be alone so that we can do complex things that, that require a lot of focus and a lot of complex manipulations. So both things are warm and both things can help you out. And sometimes you just have to decide which one is the better thing for the day. That's just like sometimes you need to be with other people and share in the warmth of community. And sometimes you need to be by yourself so that you can figure out what's going on in your own mind. And that was our talk for today. Thank you so much for sharing with me. So for a reading this morning, I've brought um, a meditation by Jeffrey Lockwood. It's called Quiet Eloquence. A universally accepted educational principle says that the ideal time to learn languages is while you are young. We might endlessly debate the best way to teach math, the surest method for conveying grammar, or the optimal way to engage students in science and art. But when it comes to languages, nearly everyone agrees that the sooner one starts, the better. There is an exception to this rule, however. One language is so difficult to learn that we must mature before even making the attempt. <coughs> and despite countless hours of drill, most adults still fail to master it. We find it hard to be silent. So I had the requisite year of French in high school, three semesters of German in college, and in my travels, I've temporarily grasped some useful phrases in Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, but never struggled as mightily with these languages as I have with my newest subject. <clears throat> Silence is the most alien of tongues. The vocabulary couldn't be simpler, and there are no rules of pronunciation or grammar or tense to memorize, but silence is the hardest language to put into practice. 
Henry Adams claimed he never labored so hard to learn a language as he did to learn to hold his tongue. For more than 40 years, I have argued, suggested, ranted, pontificated, protested, and lectured. These forms of speech have often served me well, but sometimes, too often, they have led to conflict, misunderstanding, and hurt. Gradually, I am learning that silence can be more effective. Holding my tongue is especially appropriate in response to angry words, impetuous insults, rash accusations, unintended slurs, disingenuous flattery, and painful stories. It is also powerful while on a long drive with a close friend, walking a familiar path with a lover, gardening on a summer morning with a daughter, or fishing a mountain stream with a son. Like any language, silence can be misinterpreted and misused. An icy quiet can be a way of hurting those who long for our words. A wordless evening allows us to avoid a difficult subject. But some problems that appear so enormous that they demand immediate airing crumble to insignificance with the perspective of a few quiet hours. I have often wished that I had not rushed to speak, but seldom regretted waiting in silence. I greatly admire my multilingual friends, but in middle age I've largely abandoned the idea of mastering French or German. I like to think that while learning new languages might be a gift of youth, wordlessness could be a grace of maturity. Knowing how and knowing when to be quiet is a demanding task, but with practice, it may be possible to become fluent in silence. Alone, but not lonely. All right, so I need to level with you guys. Back in October, when I was planning for this service about pulling back into yourself and finding balance after a bitter two-year-long campaign season, I was expecting a different outcome to the election. I was thinking after that long, hard-fought, divisive political season, I would be feeling relief and a need to rest. And I thought it would be safe to, you know, forget about politics for a little while and just withdraw and enjoy my own company. I did not expect that I would still be feeling that pressure to pay attention, to make my opinions known, to let my voice be heard. In fact, the, the reading that I was really tempted to read instead of one about silence and quiet and pulling inward was one about being really loud and making sure that everyone knows when something is going wrong. And so I feel a little guilty feel a lot guilty, actually, suggesting that maybe what we need right now is to study the language of silence for a little while. But in a way, for me, feeling this pressure, feeling this overwhelming sense of responsibility for something that is ultimately completely out of my control makes it even more important for me to find ways to rest my mind, to find ways of being alone without feeling lonely. And first off, let's talk about loneliness. According to Wikipedia, loneliness is an emotional response to isolation. One does not have to be physically isolated in order to feel lonely. It's possible to feel incredibly lonely while surrounded by people. Um, the example that they usually give is a traveler going to a new country and they don't speak the language, and they don't know what all the food is, and they don't know where to find their hotel, they might feel very, very lonely, very isolated. But then you can also think about people in your community who also, even though they know the language and they know where their hotel is, they might still feel isolated because they feel like they aren't connected to the people around them. Even a person at a party who is surrounded by people that they know well, they can still feel lonely because loneliness is characterized by a mismatch 
between the desired amount of social interaction, the desired level of connection with others, and the achieved amount of social interaction, how much you actually feel like you're connecting. Loneliness is an internal state, and it's determined by an internal perception of being isolated, of being unwanted. Chandra Carey, a writer at Very Well, which is a psychology blog, is among many writers who report that feelings of loneliness can raise stress levels, impact heart health, and depress immune function. In fact, Renee Garfinkel from the Institute for Crisis Risk Management and Disaster, disaster, at George Washington University, is of the opinion that being lonely carries more adverse health effects than obesity, than smoking, or poverty. Just loneliness. They've actually done um, studies on rhesus macaques, which are, um, I find them kind of inhumane. They have um, rhesus macaques, are these cute little monkeys that can survive almost any conditions. Um, Some of the experiments that they do, they raise these little rhesus macaques in um, environments where they they don't have access to any kind of um, mother figure or parenting figure. And these rhesus macaques, they don't just exhibit um, like social problems. They actually exhibit problems in their DNA replication. They exhibit brain chemistry changes. It's not, it's, loneliness is not just something that's, that's all in your head. Loneliness actually is physical. It's rooted in your body. It's rooted in your brain. Even cancer, even cancer can be affected by loneliness. Tumors of lonely people metastasize faster than tumors of people who feel that they are socially supported. And there is a stereotype that lonely people are antisocial. However, a New York Magazine article by Melissa Dahl found research indicates lonely people often have really good social skills. They actually perform better on tasks which require the ability to determine what what other people's emotions are. but they're generally just very anxious in real-life situations, which cause them to underperform. Um, Dahl says it's kind of like a baseball pitcher who has the yips, or like a a putter when, you know, they're trying to putt in their high-pressure situation. Well, to some some people who are lonely, who are searching for connection, it's a high-pressure situation every time they get close. They let their anxiety get in the way of forming those social relationships. And just in case you're curious about how they tested this, it's really interesting. What they did, um, Franklin and Marshall College professor Megan L. Knowles did this experiment while they, where they gave people questionnaires that kind of weeded out whether you felt lonely or whether you felt connected. And then they gave people a computer task where they had to identify, just based on pictures, just based on short pictures, what kind of emotions people were feeling. Now, people were assigned randomly to either a group where they were told that this was a test of their social skills, and if they performed poorly, then they were not going to do well in life. Or they were, (laughs) yeah, I know it's mean. (laughs) Or they were put in a group where they were told, oh, this is just a theoretical exercise, no big, we'll just find out what happens. Well, the non-lonely people performed pretty well, about the same in each case, whether they were like high pressure, or they were just like, eh, whatever. But lonely people, they outperformed people who identified as non-lonely when it was just, oh, it's theoretical, it's all fine. But when it was a test of how well you're going to do in life, they way underperformed. So that's loneliness. But what about solitude? You know, what about when it's just your gloves? You need to be by yourself to get something done. I mean, not all time spent alone is going to doom you to cardiovascular disease, strokes, Alzheimer's. So solitude is different from loneliness, and the different hinges upon that perception. Wikipedia, again with Wikipedia, 
They equate solitude with seclusion. And they describe it as a time when you can work, you can rest, you can think without being interrupted. Leon Nefa, a reporter with the Boston Globe, wrote in his 2011 article on the power of lonely that solitude has long been linked with creativity, spirituality, and intellectual might. The leaders of the world's great religions, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, they all had crucial revelations during periods of solitude. The poet James Russell Lowell identified solitude as needful to the imagination. In the 1988 book, Solitude, A Return to the Self, the British psychiatrist Anthony Storr invoked Beethoven, Kafka, Newton, all examples of solitary genius. So like loneliness, the experience of solitude is dependent upon one's state of mind. Now, the U.S. Forest Service has sponsored research into solitude. Yes, the U.S. Forest Service. And because one of the things that people value about national parks is getting away, is getting some solitude. So the Forest Service wanted to learn more because the vast majority of people who visit national parks do not go by themselves. In 2001, a study of Shenandoah hikers showed that although 89% of hikers came in groups of two or more, 78% of the groups reported experiencing solitude. So what was this solitude? They weren't alone. They were with other people. They defined solitude as a psychological detachment from society for the purpose of cultivating the inner world of the self. It's the act of drawing within and emotionally isolating yourself so that you can do self-discovery and self-realization, find meaning, find wholeness, and find your own deepest feelings and impulses. In a 2002 survey of Cleveland Metro Parks users, this kind of reflective thought was the most important privacy function that they found in outdoor spaces. And this is Cleveland, so it's an outdoor space in the middle of a city. But even those small outdoor spaces, bless you, in the middle of the city have those same kinds of connection with your inner self. So having time alone, having a space to reflect, feels to me like a luxury. But I have to tell you that when my daughter, when I told my daughter, but sweetheart, I like being alone, she said, what, why? <laughs> She wants to be surrounded by people. She feels really disconnected when she isn't. You know, when I picked her up from school on Friday, um, she, we go through car lines, so one of the teachers was putting her in the car and said, you know, you know what Lorelai said to me? And Lorelai's walking like this. Lorelai said that she's really sad that it's going to be Thanksgiving break. She's really sad she wants to go to school on Monday. Most kids are happy that they don't have to go to school. <laughs> Not my kids. Bless you. But despite her feelings, being detached for her friends for a short break may actually be good for her. I didn't see research for kids her age, she's five, but I did see research for teenagers. And teenagers who spend a portion of their leisure time alone seem to find benefits. So I'm going to quote here again from that Boston Globe article. Um, Nick Faya writes, teenagers, especially those whose personalities have not yet fully formed, have been shown to benefit from time spent apart from others, in part because it allows for a kind of introspection, from freedom from self-consciousness, and it strengthens their sense of identity. Reed Larson, a professor of human development at the University of Illinois, conducted a study in the 1990s in which adolescents outfitted with beepers were prompted at irregular intervals to write down questions about who they were with, what they were doing, how they were feeling. And not surprisingly, he found that when teens in his sample were alone, they reported feeling less self-conscious. They want to be in their bedrooms because they want to get away from the gaze of other people. Now, the teenagers weren't necessarily happier when they were alone. 
Adolescence, after all, can be a tough time to be separated from the group. But Larson found something interesting. On average, the kids in that sample felt better after they spent some time alone than they did beforehand. Even if it wasn't their choice, even if it was their parents' choice, they still felt better. And he also found that kids who spent between 25 and 45 percent of their non-class time alone had more positive emotions over the course of that week-long study than their more socially active peers. And they were more successful in school, and they were less likely to report depression. So teenagers who spent time alone felt better. That's an important takeaway. It can be really exhausting to try to spend that mental energy of trying to figure out what everyone around you thinks is the right thing to do and then try to do that exact right thing. When you're alone, when you are actively spending time by yourself, you don't have to spend that mental energy. You can think about what you think is the right thing. So why do we need to spend time alone? The way that you face the world is connected to the way that you face yourself. Now, I, I don't know how long I'll keep this up, but recently I joined a gym. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful thing about this gym is that it has a nursery. So the first day I went, I left Cordelia watching the Disney Channel with a nice nursery attendant, and I got on the treadmill, and I ran until I could stop thinking. I ran until I was just running. I ran until all I could concentrate in was dragging in another breath so that I could keep my feet moving. And for one hour, okay, for 54 minutes, I was able to detach from the world. And it was glorious. We need to be alone to have fully developed personalities and the ability to focus and to think creatively. Creativity expert Julia Cameron suggests in her book, The Artist's Way, which came out in like the late 1990s, but it's still awesome. Um, she suggests two activities that help us get in touch with our inner selves. She suggests morning pages and artist dates. Both of these activities focus on tapping into solitude. Morning pages are three pages of stream of consciousness that are written longhand. And they're called morning pages, but you can do them any time of day. And when they're done regularly, they help us to clear out thoughts that clutter our minds. Cameron calls this a meditation for the Western mind. Because I don't know about you, but I have a lot of trouble clearing out what's going on if I'm just trying to sit and meditate. And I am not thinking about my breathing after about five seconds. I'm thinking about what I should have put in the refrigerator and didn't the last time I checked. And maybe I should get up and make sure it got in the refrigerator because otherwise the dog will eat it. But with all these things that are clamoring for our attention, um, it seems really tough to give ourselves permission to be by ourselves. But these, these morning pages, they actually help us to write those things out, and then they're there. They're physically there. You can look at them again if you need them. Mostly you won't. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a mind-body connection, and it helps us to let go. The other activity that Cameron recommends is an artist date. And this is just scheduling time, scheduled, like put it in your calendar and don't skip it, time to be by yourself and do something you actually like to do. How transgressive did that feel? <laughs> but, you know, a, full -time stu a study of full-time caregivers found that if people do that, if they actually carve out time and and put the loved one that they're caring for, give them um, some respite care time where they can interact with other people in groups. You know, that actually gives them time to decompress. It pulls down their cortisol levels so that their stress hormones are not going crazy. Not just during the time when, when their loved one is in the care group, but during the rest of the week. Their cortisol levels go back to normal. So just having that little bit of time to yourself, it's, it's just so important. It's important to be able to be alone and to be able to recharge. Another way to be alone and to recharge, I don't know how many of you are going to like this word, 
prayer. Although as you use, we may be uncomfortable with the word prayer, but at its heart, it's just sitting quietly in contemplation. And it is beneficial. In fact, as Richard Schiffman of the Huffington Post reported in 2012, those who pray obtain health benefits from the practice. The particular type of prayer or meditation that you practice doesn't seem to matter. Dr. Andrew Newberg, director of the Center for Spirituality and the Mind at University of Pennsylvania, studies Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns. And he found that both groups of spiritual practice increase dopamine levels, that feel-good hormone. And in a separate study, Dr. Herbert Benson of Harvard Medical School discovered a relaxation response, which lowers heart rate, blood pressure, metabolism, and respiratory rate. Eric Walker Wickstrom, the author of Simply Pray, A Modern Spiritual Practice, writes, we do not pray so that God knows about people's needs. We pray to make sure that we know. You know, our faith, our UU faith, has a covenant that um, you might find in the back of the hymnal that says one of the lines is, service is our prayer. So when we open our hearts to others through prayer, we are aware of the ways that we can get out and serve others and bring that peace from serving others back into our own hearts. And here's a little more from The Power of Lonely. Uh, John Kakiopo of the University of Chicago, whose 2008 book, Loneliness, summarized a career's worth of research on all the negative things that happen to people who are lonely, said recently that as long as it's not motivated by fear or social anxiety, spending time alone is crucially nourishing in your life. Um, there's another study that says people who are socially connected with others this is, this is actually interesting because it's counterintuitive. People who are socially connected with others can have a hard time identifying people with people who are not part of their group. But if you spend time alone, then you're less closed off to others who are different. It makes us more empathetic. It makes us better social animals. And you know, when you think about it, what, that, what he says is making sense there. What do we say to our kids when they act up? We tell them, take a deep breath, count to four. And if they're still acting up, we say, okay, time out. And what do we expect them to do in that time out? We expect them to think about what they did and how they can make a better choice next time. It gives, it gives them a boost to their empathy. And it makes sense that when we're angry, we need to take a step back. We need to practice that language of silence. We need to consider that other point of view. Invoking solitude can give us a chance to take out that lens of empathy so that we can look at others' actions on their merits before we judge. So one hymn I didn't use this morning is, an, is another one from the back of the hymnal. Um, the words and music are by John Carrado. And I'm just going to read you the lyrics. It says, Voice still and small, deep inside all, I hear your call singing. In storm and rain, in sorrow and pain, still you remain singing. Calming my fears, quenching my tears, through all the years, singing. I like this song because it's a reminder that the answer is in each, in each of us. There's a still, small voice in each one of us. And that voice is hard to hear. It's hard to hear over the wailing of technology. It's hard to hear over the drone of the news stories. It's hard to hear over the hustle and bustle of everyday life. So when I suggest withdrawing from the world, when I suggest learning about being alone, I'm not advocating walling ourselves up into ivory towers. I'm advocating examining our own minds. One of our core beliefs is that we each need to determine on our own 
what our course of action is and what is moral. And it's difficult to do that without spending time in silence. Stoics in the third century BC were proponents of self-control and clear and unbiased thinking. They believed that all you can control is yourself. So if all you can control are your own actions and your own thoughts, you ought to be sure that your actions reflect your values. So back to the election. I do believe that this is a time when we need to be engaged. This is, this is a time when we need to speak and we need to act. We cannot be complacent about what's happening in the world. We cannot be complacent about what's happening in our country. We need to work together. We each stand alone, sure, but we are not alone in our beliefs. <coughs> Ours is a faith that calls us to contemplation. We need to examine what is in our hearts, and we need to act upon our beliefs. But in order to do this, we need solitude. We need peace. We need the time and the will to engage in contemplation so that when we speak, so that when we act, we remember to treat even those who disagree with us with inherent worth and dignity so that we can treat even those who insult us with justice, equity, and compassion so that our words and our actions and our deeds promote peace and liberty and justice throughout the world. Thank you.